so, so God, so, so God, so, so God, God is stack, God is stack, God is stack, good God, that's God. Welcome to Gotti Stats. With Ben Simmons. What's on the menu, Benny boy? Okay, okay. Um, on this episode of Gotti Stats, I once again welcome my good friend, Samuelson. We talk about outliers, um, namely two specific players that had crazy one season performances and we're focusing on football um and then the rest of their careers just never really matched those outputs whether it be injury or you know getting traded or change of scheme or maybe off the court or off the field stuff um it's a mystery but we get into it we uh, we go deep as we do on this podcast we also talk about um Recording artist Rockwell uh, in excess. So if you're a fan, as I am, especially of his uh, lyrical ability and his singing voice, I'm talking about the pop star Rockwell, uh, you might enjoy this podcast. In fact, uh, you will enjoy this podcast. All right? You getting excited? Well, with this uh, big, fat, uh, nearly an hour-long uh, I'm sorry, two hours long podcast. Uh, we're actually going to, on the side, we're actually going to have a personal pan pizza. And uh, I, I like it uh, thin crust with, let's, let's do a layer of uh, marinara, uh, maybe a little Italian sausage, uh, thinly cut. Uh, sprinkle some fresh basil on there, uh, maybe a little oregano, some hot chili oil, and then top that with some. Uh, a small amount of grated mozzarella. I'm not a big mozzarella guy. Is that an unpopular opinion? I don't. I don't like. It's just kind of gloppy when it congeals. It gets cold. It gets gross. So I'm gonna do. Uh, go light on the mozzarella. Heavy on the uh, parmesan, uh, romano, pecorino, tachico, balego, uh, all that cheese, asago, what any kind of powdered cheese lying around. Put that on top. Um, and then eat it. It's going to be great. Great pod. Hope you enjoy. Let's hit it. What's up, man? Samuel. How are you, my friend? What's going on? I'm good. Uh, nothing much. I just uh, did a little morning workout. A little out of breath. Just a, yeah. little, bit, a little out of shape. Ah, Got to get back in the groove. That's right. Well, this is this is the worst time of year to be doing that. So I commend you for for the attempt with all the holiday food and indeed. It's cold uh, too. My my bones are brittle. My muscles yeah. are tight. Yeah, uh, that that isn't it. That's an early workout out on the West Coast. Yeah. I, I was I was running with the uh with the Ravens overhead. Very very bleak, very bleak atmosphere out there. Uh-huh. Kind of depressing. But, um, you and uh, you and Yusuf Nurkic. <laughs> oh God, I love that guy. I love that man. Running, running in, in sweatpants shorts through a through a forest. He you actually picture Portland. I don't know. Am I wrong? Well, he he actually. Well, you're not that far off in the residential neighborhoods. It's uh, there's there's a right. few more houses, but there are really tall trees, big timbers. Uh, but I, but I picture Yusuf running in like a Conan the Barbarian outfit, kind of That's like, true. just like hacking through the forest, like just like yeah. ha- hacking through all the animals that he comes in and come in, in his path, yeah. like, just cutting a deer's head off as he, as he canters, <laughs> canters yeah. violently through the, through the foliage. <clears throat> yeah, no, I think that's right. Cutting down trees while you, while you work out. So you're like actually doing work while you, while you exercise. Right? That makes, <laughs> that makes sense. It's the way they used um, to, that's the way they used to do it back in the day. That's right, yeah. Back in back in the day. Now these these millennials who favored each other's tweets and Instagram, like they don't even know. They don't even know. Man. So, doing their special handshakes after the game, they don't they don't know. Yeah. I, I, I gotta um, say though, I saw this Instagram video of uh I'm not I'm not I hope this doesn't make me sound like an old man, but I 
I saw this Instagram video of this, of this, uh, it was like a one-on-one -on -one drill in football, and it was like, a, it was like a, a kid just trying to, like, he had a football in his hand, he was trying to get by this other defender, and there's all these players, it was at some football camp or something, and he, yeah. like, he, in the video, they slowed it down on his jukes, so, like, he did, it did, like, a Matrix style, like, it was really fast, and they slowed it down when he juked, so he kind of juked the pants off this guy and got by him. And then, like, 80 kids just went absolutely nuts. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I guess, I'm guessing they're, like, freshmen, sophomore, high school, maybe maybe junior, senior. But they went bonkers just for this one play. And, like, maybe there was some sort of suspenseful element to it. Like, maybe it was like, well, if you juke this guy, then we get the rest of the camp off or we get the rest of the day off or something. So that's why they went so crazy. But – they they acted like uh, he just hit like the game winning shot game seven of right. the NBA finals, and uh, I'm just saying if you if you react that way for something so uh, I'm not gonna say minute but just something kind of so low level, uh, how do you react when there actually is it is a, a moment for that sort of reaction? Like, do you just I'll have tell you who never did I'll tell you who never did that sentence. Yeah. Y A Tittle. <laughs> You never saw why he's still doing that. But you know what? George Mikan never did that. George Mikan never did that. I thought you said George Michael at first. He also, George Michael, may he rest in peace, also never did that. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's the teens going for their viral content, right? It's all about the content. That's what we're, we're in the it's content about game. Getting, we're in the con getting viral. Yeah. Making your making your, your content go viral. And I guess I guess that was an example. I think it was. Damn it, I think it was. They got me. I watched it a few times, too. Replayed it, liked it. Yeah. <laughs> shared it. <laughs> right, right. Shareable content. Right. It's important to integrate your content across all platforms. Well, I'm in, a, I'm in the content game right now, and let me tell you, this is some quality content right here. Right I agree. Now, at this moment. You know, I got some rave reviews uh, on my first podcast appearance. People liked um, you. People liked you. Not, not really. Not. Re I personally didn't. I always like the my one of my favorite Thirty Rock jokes was when they, uh, when they have uh, Chris Parnell on as that doctor who's a moron, <laughs> and he says he's advertising a drug. He's advertising this like wonder drug, and he says, uh, he says, nine out of ten doctors say, who is this? Why are you calling so late? <laughs> it's one of my favorite my favorite things on. On Thirty Rock, and that's kind of how it was. Uh, Chris Parnell is underrated. Podcast. He is, he is. My first podcast appearance, it was just like, hey, what did you think? And nobody knew what I was talking about, so I was like, all right, I'll take that as positive positive feedback. Well, um, I I've been chatting a little bit with uh, two of our good friends from across. I guess they're I wouldn't say across the pond. They're uh, uh -huh. they're overseas. They're one of them's in Hong Kong. One of them. Is an uh, is an Aussie. He, I guess he's right. he's technically an Aussie now. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Mike. He o fled. He, st he sought and, political asylum in Australia. Yes, indeed. Uh, so so uh, young Michael and uh, Gize, uh over in Hong Kong. So those guys had they, they said they loved that episode with you. It was a favorite one. So uh, you know you can uh, put that feather in your cap. And wear it, well, all, wear it around them. town all day. Yeah, I appreciate that. That that's nice of them. Um, so, man, Simmons, do I have stats for you today? Okay, uh, you always do. I have my I have my glasses halfway down the bridge of my nose, like Dirk Cutter, <laughs> in an attempt to make myself look smart. Um, are they just like? Are the glasses actually just? There's no prescription. It's just like basically a window pane. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Have you yeah. seen that? By the way, have you seen Dirk Dirk Cutter the way he does that? In yeah, the, in I've the seen him. It's like, dude, you're yeah, four I've and ten. Him. All right, why don't we stop with the, the charade that you're some like, you know, you just get you just wear your wear your contacts. I, you know what, I, I, I'm a sucker for the, for the uh, professorial coach though. <laughs> so like, I I I totally get what you're saying, and I, I kind of agree. But at the same time, another part of me is like, God, he's like. 
you know, if, if there's a guy with like glasses like that, I'm like, why would we fire that guy? He's so smart. Like, you know, it, it, <laughs> no, that's, 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 I think the trick, I think it works though. Like I'm fine with it. I mean, again, this is speaking of making, making me sound like hopelessly old. I'm fine with it when he, if your team is winning. Yeah. I think it would look I th- I, like if Popovich did it, I think, okay, yeah, that's cool. But, Pop can do Pop can do anything though now. He can. That's right. That's true. He can do whatever he wants. But he can, he can wear like a ball a ballroom dress to the sideline. People would be like, right. interesting. Harbaugh Harbaugh does it sometimes. You know, Harbaugh wears those glasses and it looks like he's like a Cold War spy, and <laughs> he wins wherever he goes. Just John so or Jim it works fine. Uh, uh, Jim. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Jim. Uh, John is actually. On the Harbaugh scale, John is remarkably sane. I think. Yeah. I mean, no, he, I agree. I agree. He makes Jim makes him look like a normal a normal man. Uh, <laughs> Jim is Jim is not a normal man at all. Yeah, I, I think anyone. I, I heard a podcast with with uh, Jim. I think it was a part of my take, and um, he was he went into this like he was just talking. You know, he's a weird guy. They were talking about all kinds of stuff, and then he just went into this rant about like. Uh, non-organic food. How he's like in favor of he, he hates organic food, and he and then he started talking about how he loves milk that's like processed and not organic. It was just I, I mean I, I I eat non-organic stuff. I eat organic stuff. I'm not getting on one yeah. one side or the other. But it's just funny yeah. like how he doesn't take stands for many things. But when it comes to milk, uh, he's extremely well, you- emotional and uh, he really yeah. cares about it. You can I can never tell if he's in on the joke or not. If he if he yeah. if he's like intentionally being that ridiculous or if that's just how his, he is. You know good what point. I mean? It's a good point. I mean, he had the the milk thing, you know, the milk thing stemmed from that picture that that uh kind of spread around a year or two ago where he took a picture where he was like at a steakhouse. Do you, do you are you familiar with this picture? No, I haven't seen it. He took a picture with his I believe he was with his wife. And they were at a nice steakhouse. I think he was wearing like his coaching gear or something. He was dressed <laughs> sort of only the way that Jim Harbaugh would dress to go to like a nice restaurant. But what what set the internet off about the picture is that he he had what appeared to be milk poured into his wine glass, and he was drinking <laughs> milk milk out of a wine glass at like a nice steakhouse. I wouldn't be surprised um, if he mixed milk into his wine. Yeah, like, he's that yeah. kind of guy, you know. He is. He's the kind of guy who he could do that, or he could say like, "No toxins. I don't need wine. I, I can, yeah. I'm good with milk. Milk is wine's not going to help my bones. Wine's not going to help me help me uh, achieve peak performance as a coach." It's a good point. It's a good point. I'll tell you what will though. I'll tell you what Willow Simmons. Some whole milk. <laughs> Some whole milk and a and a ribeye. I mean, I think he probably drinks half and half at this point. He just <laughs> drinks big like thirty two ounce oh, glasses God. of half and oh, half oh, every God. morning. Just oh Jesus, just, he just drinks it does. all day long. It's a very Michigan, it's an upper Midwest kind of thing to do. There should there's some yeah it is uh, there should be some scientists to get together and like study his diet and try to figure out like if if he like unlocks some sort of you know primitive yet new age. Uh, diet that's like, you know, giving him an edge somehow. Right. But this all this. You milk. study. They can study his brain for the effects that drinking half and half for 20 years <laughs> has had on his his sort of cognitive and physical abilities. I think that would be good. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I I do have to mention as a Niners fan that uh, he still holds a special place in my heart, and I wish he was still with the Niners. I mean, I. I, I, of course, um, uh, I'm gushing about Jimmy G, and I was talking yeah. talking to those Niners fans. I just mentioned um, – I'm not sure if I mentioned that they were Niners fans, but Mike O and uh, Geezy are both uh, Gold Panther fans. And, yeah, uh, you guys are all long time, long time. I mean, you, these, are not, these are not bandwagon Niners fans we're no, dealing with. No, no. We, we, we lasted through the dark ages of Alex Smith, although it wasn't Alex Smith's fault. I still like Alex Smith. None of that was his fault. He literally had a different offensive coordinator every single year he was there. I think maybe one yeah, year. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even think of that as the dark ages, Simmons. The dark ages to me were like Tim Rattay. 
Yeah, but he, you know, there's there's some interesting stats about Tim Rattay. I think he was oh, the. Boy. I think he was the okay. only. All right, I, I kind of blew it. I was gonna try to quiz you, but I think he was uh, the only 49ers quarterback to have back-to-back 400-yard passing games. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. I would never. I'm looking at um, somebody his stats right now. So somebody can can check me on that, um, and it, you know it's probably pretty easily searched on. Uh, pro football. It was probably in that 2004 season. Um, yeah, he played nine games in 2004. Uh, he had ten touchdowns and ten picks. He threw for 2,169 yards. Nice. He was. Uh, yeah. So I mean, he looks like he got hurt, or he came in in the middle of the season, but he was on pace to throw for over 4,000 yards. Yeah, but I, I'm not trying to say that. Uh... That I uh, I think he's like an amazing quarterback. I mean, those were those were the dark ages. And now that I'm looking at his stats, I can't find uh-huh. I can't find the back to back 400 yard games. But it might have been. Let's see. Did he throw for? I'm checking 2003. Oh, this is great radio. This it's is, uh, very good. Uh, deep dive into Tim Rattay's <laughs> career. Well, it's good for me. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. Hold on. Well. Maybe he was like the the first one in X amount of years, or like, you know, um, he did have a 400 yard passing game in 2004, um, but I don't see back to back. So I I might have to uh, recant my previous statement in shame. But That's um, okay. So That's he did okay. have 400. Okay, so on uh, it was a fateful day. We all remember it. October 10th, uh-huh. 2004, against the Arizona, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, yeah. The Niners won 31 to 28. That was the only win Tim Rattay had that whole season. He yeah. had um, he 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 was struck by lightning, I think, before the game, and uh-huh. he was 38 okay. for 57, yeah. for 66 completion percentage, 417 yards and two touchdowns. He also ran the ball five times for 26 yards. Is there anything – oh, I'm sorry. He ran the ball three times for 26 yards. Is there anything this guy can't do? That's, that's, that's true. I mean, I think we all remember where we were. I was in college, presumably watching somewhere. I'm pretty sure I was still asleep. I remember – I was I probably, like, exactly passed out. I was. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that, that could be true, too. Yeah. Probably a, a late game, though. So probably by that point you were yeah. awake. If it yeah. were if it were a San Francisco Arizona game, it's probably it on the way back game. from uh, some Chinese buffet, and there you uh, go. and yeah, I was probably it's Had probably to get back for NFC West action. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's get on task. Enough of this. Uh... Actually, let me let me let me. That's a good place because I want to ask you about Jimmy G real fast because oh. um, Talk what did they him. say? What did your what did your what did our mutual friends say about him? I mean. Obviously, I think they haven't been able to watch the games, but yeah. Well, they've watched. They've watched a little bit. I think um, they might have. Uh, it, it seems like they're they're pretty well versed on him at, at this point. But the thing with Jimmy G is, and you know, the same logical side of me, which is a very small side of me, is saying uh, Simmons. You know, he had a small sample size here. Uh, it's the end of the season. You know, the schedule has been decent. Although the Bears game, they have a good defense, I think. They're underrated. And it was at, it was at Chicago. But, you know, Jimmy right. G hasn't thrown for a lot of touchdowns with the Niners. Been a lot of field no. goals. Robbie uh, Gold has been lights out. Uh, mm-hmm. He's been on fire. If, yep. You know, he can't miss. Um, he's, you know, good as gold, plays for the gold panners. You know, everyone's going crazy with the, uh, the gold thing. And they should because – he is like their MVP right now in a way because like they've been winning a lot of these games with tons of field goals. But right. in terms of Jimmy G, we all we all think they should ink him as soon as possible, and we're, we've we've gone gaga for for Jimmy. Like I think all of Niners Nation has because we're just so starved for um, winning, and also like he fits the mold. He he has the Golden Boy next Forty ers quarterback written all over him. It's like he fits the part. 
uh, in terms of his on-field performance, and just like the hype surrounding him, uh, I think is driving all of us to want to lock him up as soon as possible. I think they should. I mean, why not? If you're gonna, if the Bears are gonna fork over whatever they're paying Mike Glennon per year, give that to mm-hmm. Jimmy. You know, you can always trade him. Um, you know, if he gets hurt or like something, if it go, all goes sour, uh, just lock him up. He's an asset. Um, I'm not sure what it's, what the, what Jimmy G's side of it is. If an agent maybe wants to go somewhere else or, but like, that's just, what, just, what is his contract situation? I think he, after this year, he's going to be a free agent. Yeah. I mean, um, they, they need to, they need to pay him whatever he wants. I yeah. mean, I, I ask you because. I I definitely watching the Niners Titans game on Sunday. I felt like there was a buzz in the crowd, and that mm. there was more. There were more people there, and there was. Oh just, yeah. It feels like a lot of suburbanites. This is the first time since Harbaugh left that there's been a lot of excitement around that franchise, and it's it's yeah. all related to to Garoppolo. I think if you look at his profile, you know. Uh, out of Eastern Illinois, the same school where Tony Romo came from, you know, not a not a big time college quarterback in terms of where he played. He's 26, so he has had a few years to sort of, uh, you know, he was with the Patriots and studied under Tom Brady and learned all the uh, the mm. learned all of Tom Brady's pseudoscience with his <laughs> trainer. Um, and, you know, obviously Belichick helped him. He was with McDaniels. Now he's with Shanahan, who was the architect of one of the most successful offenses in um, in NFL history last year before, yep. for some reason, he decided to stop running the ball in the Super Bowl when Matt Bryant would have made a field goal and easily won, the Falcons would have easily won. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, the point is, is that he's got this sort of pedigree, right? Yeah. And I just want to, I know this is a stats podcast, but yeah, I want to take you back in the, in the time machine for a second. Okay. I'm Simmons. ready. I'm um, ready. got my, uh, got my granola bar. Let's go. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Got a little snack. Uh, if we can get, if there's like a, 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 there's like a, um, time machine sound effect somewhere, right? Uh, I'll try. Like that, you know, right? I'll, I got, yeah. I got a question. Is there a bathroom in the time machine? Uh, there is. Good. Yeah. Good. Just curious. So, so you're you're covered. You're good. Good. So right. I like that November twenty ninth. Perfect. You 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 don't have to you don't have to worry or sweat. Right. Well, you still probably have a little sweat, but yeah, don't worry I'll about sweat it. Sweat a little bit. November twenty ninth, two thousand seven. All right. Mm. You're asking why is he bringing up that date? What does that mean? November twenty. Well, sort of like October tenth, two thousand four, when Tim Rattay magically turned into Joe Montana and Steve Young. Mm. Yes. For, for a game, uh, this date was important because a, on a in a Thursday night game that featured the ten and two Green Bay Packers versus the eleven and one Dallas Cowboys, uh, oh, Brett Favre in the middle of the game injured his shoulder hmm. and had to leave the game early. Now when he left the game, he was five five of fourteen for fifty six yards and two picks. <laughs> but in stepped um, uh, Aaron Rodgers hey Rod. to this game. Rog. Um Now, Favre, this put Favre's consecutive game streak in jeopardy, and he ended up playing the following week because, of course, he did. Because he did. the most important thing is was the streak. It wasn't actually doing what was best for the team. It was no. the streak. Never was. But for, for three quarters of this game or however long it was, Rodgers played. Dallas was 11 and 1. They ended up winning the game 37 to 27. Um the Packers did? But no, no, excuse me, Dallas did. Okay. Romo threw for four touchdowns. I've got the game log here. Patrick Creighton had two touchdowns in this game, 3 for Jesus. 42 and 2. Uh oh. shout out to Patrick Creighton. I forgot um, about him. Loyal listener of the of the Gaudy Stats podcast, Patrick yeah. Creighton. Yeah, he um, yeah, he texts me all the time. Yeah, but I'm bringing this up because – okay, and now now Roger's stats in this game were not gaudy. He was 18 of 26, 201, a touchdown, right? Mm. Uh, actually not unlike what what Jimmy G's lines have looked like in terms of touchdown output. Yeah, what about the but rushing, rushing this, yards? 
Uh, in that game, he had five rushing rushes oh, for 30 okay. yards. Yeah. That's pretty but, good. That's pretty good. I mean, that's like yeah, yeah, classic yeah. Rodgers. Right. And here's the thing, though, Simmons. This was his first game, basically. Like, he had been in mop-up duty a couple games before that, but it was his third year, and he came in basically cold at on the road against the best team in the NFC, and he was good. Like, yeah. immediately he was good. Yeah. And I bring that up to make the point that, look, it's still really early, but, like, Jimmy G, from what I've seen, he just, like, when you come in and you're just good right away, I think that that – I'm not, not breaking any news here or breaking any ground with my analysis, but I think that's a really good sign Yeah, for his long ter- long-term potential because he's got those co- – he's got Shanahan. They're going to get some free agents. He doesn't really have – any, I mean, no disrespect to Marquise Goodwin, who's a fine enough receiver, but he's mm. not even close to a number one, right? Wow. Um, that is, that is get disrespectful. In. I can't you, believe you, you disagree. I can't believe you just said that. No, I'm joking. But, like, no, no. I, I, it's just funny that he's always open, though. Like, he, he is, No, no, look, he's good. But, like, come on. You know, no, I, mean, I know, I know, I know. He's not like he's not like a you know six three athletic. No, he's no, no, no. He's not in that mold. He's like a good number two or maybe a slot guy. Um, I that's exactly what I think he is. Yeah, and and he's really, but he's playing well. He's playing great. But yeah. I'm at, what's going to happen when they get when they get like an actual? What's going to happen when Kyle Shanahan gets his version of Julio Jones and say, not to not to get you all hot and bothered on Whoa. early on a on a Wednesday morning, but like. When Kyle J- Shanahan gets his version of Julio Jones for Jimmy, yeah, it's gonna, you know it's gonna be beautiful. I mean, they just, they, be... they can't fuck this up. I mean, they can't. They got to ink him as soon as possible. It, it, it's it's a good business move too. I mean, it's gonna be good. It's gonna bring in a lot of fans. You know, the, there's the dormant, um, well, not dormant now, but like the uh, red and gold. Red and Gold Nation has been pretty dormant, you know, recently since Harbaugh right. left. Since they right. fired Hall, Harbaugh, and they they they, they chose to ride at, ride with uh, Trent Balky, and uh, fired Harbaugh. They took his they took yeah. Balky's side, then they hired an auto mechanic to be the head coach. <laughs> and since, from that moment on, you know, the defensive fans, coordinator and recurring SNL character Jim Tomsula. Yes, exactly. He had one fine season. Yeah, I mean he's a great coach, but he's just not a great head coach. I mean, everything you read about the guy, he's he's a, uh, I mean he's like the quintessential to borrow something again from the Pardon My Take podcast. He's a quintessential football guy. I mean he's just uh mm-hmm. he's just like a football guy through and through, um, and he's great. Would you like say a, that he brings his lunch pail to work? <laughs> yes. The man brings more than just a lunch pail. He probably brings lunch pails for everybody there. He like brings uh-huh. his and then brings like a, a truck full of lunch pails. He's got them. a lunch pail for him and for others. There's bologna in it. There's salami. <laughs> little provolone. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm getting me hungry now. Definitely nothing green. No. No. I Although I... His lunch. It's just, it's just starch and meat. <laughs> Meat and potatoes guy, you know he. Uh, yeah. th- there were some some photos I saw on the internet of him. This was I guess a few years ago. I'm not sure when it was, but uh, of him, he was uh, working out, and they, like th- there's some shots of him like at some 24 hour fitness somewhere in like Florida or something. He was I think it was his year off, you know, when he got fired. He just had all that time, and he's getting paid like you know a million dollars a year or whatever it was, and so he's just like working out. And I think I think now he's. Uh, He's in game shape, so I'm not sure. Perfect. He he's a coach for some team now. I don't know. He, he's which... a defensive. Co- I think he's a. I think he coaches with the Redskins, doesn't he? Oh, okay. Okay. I think I think he's a Washington assistant. Nice. Um, by the way, before we before we proceed, uh, the official running back of Gaudy Stats, Rod Smith, converted tight end. Uh, Is he really a converted tight end? 
No, I, I just made that up because he's a fullback, right? Because he, he's, but he's I wouldn't. Fullback. I would. I I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the the man is. He's a load. Yeah, he 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 he's listed as a fullback. Um, <laughs> he's he had seven carries for thirteen yards and a touchdown. Three catches for twenty-one yards. He helps keep Dallas's faint playoff hopes alive. Mm. Um, Good for him. He's, he he remains not a water bug, but he is <laughs> he is a. Uh, you know, um, I started he's to interrupt a water you. bug in our hearts. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, that doesn't Dan, make any sense. Dan, anyway, proceed. No, no, no. It, it makes plenty of sense to me. Uh, Dan, <laughs> okay. Dan Manila. Uh, a friend of mine, I think. Are you are you friends with Dan? You 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 crossed yeah. paths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. crossed paths with Dan. Yeah, you, you're friends with Ben. I have, yeah. Um, he he uh, came up with the idea of a uh, beetlebacks. So mm. it's kind of like the inverse of the water bug. You have, I from what I got, it, it's probably for the backs who you know the Mike Gillisley types. Even though Mike Gillisley can catch the ball, we've seen that. But you know, who just get the ball like kind of a Legarrette Blunt, uh, okay. in that mold, Beetlebacks. I like it. Yeah. yeah, but we still need to come up with what Rod Smith is. Um, he's I don't I don't know what the hell he is. I mean, is he a Beetle? See, because like Beetlebacks, I don't know if they should be able to catch the ball well. Like Brandon Jacobs is a Beetleback. You know. You know, I did some market research for Mantis back, and the returns were not were not they were mixed. So I don't know if Mantis back <laughs> is really gonna stick. All right, well, the we'll people see. were the people were unsure. All right, I well, like I like the Beetleback thing though. You know, um, you talking who like Mike Tolbert? Yes, perfect yeah. example. Perfect there example. You know, uh, but so we still need to find like <clears throat> you know what like the D'Angelo Williams type back. You know, who can catch it, who can also run it, like you kind know, of or even. Um, Maybe it's like an all-purpose back, you know, like Le'Veon Bell, uh, mm-hmm. Carlos Hyde. I don't know. Well, it'll materialize itself. It's one of those things where it'll just it'll just appear to us one day. Like, you know, we're on like a peyote-fueled uh, vision quest, and suddenly the answer just to all your you know all your questions just appears. And that's it comes gonna, to us in a, in a dream. That's what's gonna happen with this with, with these. Uh, these monikers, because we need to be able to uh, label these guys properly. I don't want to have to every time be like, oh, he kind of catches a few balls, but, he, you know, I just want to be like Beetleback, water bug. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And they all have to be some sort of bug. With like a sound, with a sound drop for water bug or, or Beetleback also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and to segue really fast um, into kind of what we're going to talk about in this pod, uh, mm-hmm. outliers. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah, kind babe. Of, kind, <laughs> kind of like you know maybe like one year wonder types. Yep. Uh, yep. We could also call certain backs elephant backs. Um, it's Ooh. not it's not a bug, but um, there was a really funny little blurb from Roto World. Uh, that was about four years old. That I think I shared with you a while ago. But I'm not, I'm not sure if I did. But um, remind me, you probably did. Remind is, me. Okay, so this is from four years ago. All right, um, and it's about our boy Peyton Hillis. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. He okay. he he had he had been, who knows, on his ranch, you know, in, in a one bedroom apartment in New Jersey, like wearing a you know a muscle tee, uh, <laughs> with a you know, with a personal pan pizza on his stomach, like half asleep. He was, he was just like a, he was like a spring, if a Springsteen song were a person. Yeah. That's what, that's the kind of life he was living. Then, then his, uh, rotary phone rang. He doesn't have a cell phone and mm-hmm. he, he answered it and it was, uh, Mike Tomlin. Uh, come on. He said, he said, uh, what that translates to is that we need you to come and start at running back for us on a Monday night football. And right. Peyton Hillis got in his, uh, you know, I don't know, was it was like a Ford Blazer maybe? Um, he jalopy. Got, <laughs> he got in his jalopy. He drove, um, I believe this was in New York, 
and uh, he played he played a Monday Night Football game. Now here is the Roto World blurb that I, I find very amusing. Okay. Okay. Peyton Hillis admitted to having Jello legs on Monday night. <laughs> Just a week ago, Hillis was at uh, home, home on his ranch in Tennessee and not even working out. So I was wrong about the New Jersey thing. On Monday, he touched the ball 23 times on 48 snaps and produced 81 of the ugliest yards you'll ever see. (laughs) Hillis ran around the field like an elephant, unable to even move his hips, just plowing into defenders. (laughs) And then there's stuff stuff about Brandon Jacobs maybe coming back, but (laughs) I don't know. It just cracked me up. (laughs) Listen, all right. 81 yards on 23 touches when you're you're literally off the couch. Yeah. It's not bad. You know? Yeah. Um, that. Second yeah. of all, you know, I don't know if an elephant has ever gone to the combine, but like kind of disrespectful to elephants, right? They're top <laughs> in speed. They can, they can probably they can probably hit that second level and and you know, uh I bet I I'll bet an elephant would be a, a decent enough tight end. Oh, right? yeah. Or maybe like a power back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so why don't you, uh, why don't you lay off the animal kingdom, Roto World? Leave that to us. Exactly. We, we understand man. the we understand the cross species uh, comparisons <laughs> better than they do. Peyton Hillis, though, what a guy. Oh, you gotta love that guy. Before we talk about outliers, let me give a quick aside though, okay? Sure. I mentioned this to you uh, briefly before we recorded, but um, I noticed last time we did bring up a lot of Saints running backs. Mm. We talked about Reggie Bush. We talked about Pierre Thomas. We talked about Mm -hmm. Alvin Kamara. Mm -hmm. Um, That got me thinking and then led me to check the, the archives of our fantasy league, and I stumbled upon a crazy statistic, which is that in the Sean Payton Drew Brees era, uh, which began in 2006 in New Orleans, Brees um, Brees came over from San Diego, and I believe Sean Payton came from Dallas. I want to say he was a coordinator mm. at Dallas, and yeah, then uh, right. he was Parcells' offensive coordinator, I think. Um, in that time, since 2006, so that's 12 seasons now. We're, we're closing in on 12 seasons. One one of the two of us has had at least one major share of the Saints offense in our fantasy league in ten of the twelve seasons, Ben. It's that's just crazy. Ten of twelve. All yeah. right. You're talking either Drew Brees or Jimmy Graham or mm-hmm. uh Darren Sproles or oh, Ingram yeah. or Kamara or Colston or Reggie Bush. Yeah. I mean that that is so if anyone is wondering why we talked about New Orleans so much. It's because we love New Orleans. Yeah. We love New Orleans, the city, but we also love the Saints. It's a fun team. It's a fun team to have players on in fantasy. Yeah. Um, at some point, we can maybe do the definitive gaudy stats, uh, uh, Peyton Breeze, Saints era. I feel like oh, hell based yeah. on what I, what I just offered, maybe we would be the two best people qualified to discuss it. Some interesting ups and downs, you know, a Super Bowl, an onside kick to open a second half of the Super Bowl. Mm. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe kind of a suspension for paying players to hurt other people <laughs> that Sean Payton may have served. So, you know, just really a, a wide range of um, of uh, events I know. that have taken place. It's, uh, it, it, you, you hit it, the nail on the head. They're just a fun team. I mean, any team that involves their running backs in the passing game as much as they do, I'm gonna def- I'm gonna be, you know, zeroed in on. Mm-hmm. Because, and they, and that's something they've done, you know, in the in the Sean Payton Drew Brees era. And yeah, we will definitely do a Drew Brees, a definitive Drew Brees pod, which will certainly splinter off into, you know, the various running backs and the wide receivers slash tight ends, Marcus Colson, and uh, we will. We will touch on um, the multiple 5,000-yard passing seasons that Drew Brees has had. He will likely – well, he won't have that this year because, you know, inexplicably, you know, the year that I, I draft him 
for fantasy. He decide they decide to, you know, ground and pound. Um, right. After having he had fifty two thousand yards passing He's last year. He's running like seven times in our league, by the way. Did you know that? Yeah, I'm not surprised. I love Drew Brees, and I I feel like I mean we used to have six point touchdowns in our fantasy league, right. and then we added completions and quarterbacks were so overvalued uh, yeah. that I would draft him. I felt like, you know, I felt like that was, you know, I was onto something drafting a quarterback early. It really bit me in the ass though some years, and mm-hmm. other other years it was <laughs> definitely a mistake. Other years, other years it won you the league. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I. I I don't know. Like, but there was that one year uh, we switched to four touchdown passes. I think during this, but my cousin, uh, one of my good friends, one of your good friends, um, Michael O, he he drafted Peyton Manning like late in the draft, and that was a year where he had like what like seven hundred touchdowns for the Broncos. Uh-huh. With that yep. first that first game, he threw like six or seven. I don't know. He like. First game of the season. I, I don't know if he had – I I was against, I believe, another member of our league, Spencer, had Manning that year. Because I think that first oh. – that year that I did Manning – you talking about the where the game against the Ravens where he threw seven uh, – seven Yes, times? yes. Yeah, I was against Peyton Manning, and I thought, I thought that Spencer had him. Anyway, this has been our weekly uh, Fantasy League segment. But, <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, no, you're right. Like – QBs and and the way that their value has sort of ebbed and flowed, it is interesting. Uh, yeah, well, that based on the really... scoring system and and yeah, and what I mean, Breeze isn't a good example this year of of a good QB who maybe has not necessarily lost his fastball, but they sort of happened upon this these two this this system where both running backs stayed healthy. We talked about it last last time I was on, and they've just sort of really kind of. Um, sort of stumbled upon I keep using the verb stumbled but they've sort of they've just sort of backed into this offense where they give both these guys the ball a ton I saw yesterday it was the first time since the 1970s that two running backs from the same team have been named to the Pro Bowl and you're right I mean that has Breeze has sort of statistically has definitely suffered the consequences um but just to, to wrap that up I just to ask you a a rhetorical, a non-rhetorical rhetorical question. Uh, is there anything better as a neutral fan or as a fantasy football player than the game where the Saints offense is humming in the Superdome and there's a lot of points and the other team is scoring with it? Is there anything better? No. I don't think there is. There's nothing better. Um, the, other, I mean, I... the other team is matching its output, so, you know, they have to keep playing and yeah, keep throwing and being aggressive. I mean, I just think that's like the most, just about the most fun game you can have. Yeah, and there've been so many of them. I mean, for me, I always enjoyed when they'd play the Falcons. It seemed like they were like every time they would play the Falcons, even if it was at Atlanta because they had an indoor stadium as well, and they had a dome. So you would just every time they play, there'd be a big output on each in either side, you know, and um. You could, you, you know, yeah. if you're playing DFS, you could start your Falcons. Start, you know, it was just like it was just a points extravaganza. This year, the Falcons haven't been the offensive juggernaut they've been in the past, and Breeze isn't as as involved. So, of course, you start like the running backs on each side, but uh, unfortunately, it feels like the Breeze era might be coming to an end. Um, hate to say it, but I do hope that he either stays. And they uh, revitalize some of the passing attack. Um, although I think that's unlikely if they still have those two backs. Or if he maybe he goes somewhere, maybe, I don't know, like um, somebody was suggesting he might go to Arizona or something. And, like, mm. that would be interesting because you have David Johnson, who is a all-purpose stud, and he catches a lot of balls. Right. So that would be fun. Right. Um, and you know that that's an interesting move. I wouldn't really understand that move from a winning perspective because I think Arizona is in a very tough spot right now with the Rams up and coming and the Niners yeah. up and coming if they sign Jimmy G, and they both have you know good young coaches who are in position to succeed. 
Do you still um, have Seattle? Seattle? Seattle's window is sort of closing, it looks like, and they're not going to be able to pay all their players, yeah. which I think Chris Kemp may have alluded to when on his uh, rambling, blubbering 100-minute podcast that he did with you. Um, but, no, I mean, I feel like Breeze is going to finish his career in New Orleans mostly because whatever he has suffered in terms of stati- statistical uh, downturn – is made up for by the fact that they're winning. Yeah. And I think at this point in his career, you know, they went seven and nine, three years in a row. And to the, ex- to, to the, to the extent that he plays much longer or however much longer he plays, I think if he sees that their this team is in a position to go 10 and six or 11 and five for, for the foreseeable future, potentially, I, I just would guess that he, he will cl- finish his career in New Orleans, but perhaps that's wishful thinking. I don't know. I guess we'll see. I hope he does, but there's, it's weird. There's something coming out of New Orleans. I don't know if it's a leak or what. I keep seeing these blurbs about how, oh, they think Drew Brees has lost a step. Oh, you know, they might move on from Drew Brees next year. I mean, I I agree with you completely, and I think they should hold on to Brees. I mean, he's a technician, in the short passing game and in the and in the long passing game too, kind of underrated in that respect. I mean, we remember all those bombs to Devery Henderson um, when you'd pick him up on fantasy after he had a huge game, and then he'd get like <laughs> and then he he'd catch one, one pass for for twelve yards. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he can throw the deep ball. He can throw the you know he's he's definitely shorter. He's famous for mm-hmm. doing that little like lean back look. You know, where he looks kind of barely can see over the lineman and stuff, but. The man has been super effective. This year he has had, as a uh, owner of him in fantasy, I can attest that he's he's had a down year statistically. Uh, he's yeah. thrown he's thrown some he had some bad interception games, but um, who else? Did are you, you gonna... watch the game? Did you watch the Saints Jets game? I didn't watch the whole game. I had it on red zone. I was kind of going back and forth. Yeah, he had a throw in that game. Jets actually played really tough and, and did a really good job in for the most part containing that, that running that rushing attack. Hmm. Um the Jets really I mean, they were they were up for that game after yeah. the complete no show in Denver the week before. Yeah. But uh a decent defense. Yeah, no, they were their defense was really given the Saints issues, but um Breeze had a throw in that game and it was like a third and long I want to say they were in, they were in Jets territory and he threw the ball to the sideline. It might have been the possession where Brandon Coleman had two terrible fumbles. Oh, I game. saw that. I saw that. Um, one of which almost was like a cartoon fumble where like the yeah. ball went backwards like ten yards and it didn't even really even on replay it didn't really seem real. But uh, he had a throw. I I think it was to Michael Thomas where. He like was it in the end zone? Sort of. It was not. It was not the one that was overturned. Because that one was a, a perfect throw. It was. It was a great throw. Yeah, and and Michael Thomas just had like his toe on the line. Yeah. But he had a throw outside the numbers to the sideline, where it was just like, <clears throat> all right, this guy can still play. Like they, it was yeah. just sort of a reminder, like okay, I'm still Drew Brees. I yeah. still can make these throws when I need to. Yeah, and um, it's like he doesn't get as many reps a game as he used to either. It's like the man, I mean, their, their running game used to be their short passing game. I mean, they, they, I remember they would have games where like, you know, Reggie Bush would rush for like, I mean, we've joked about it. You know, he'd have like 30 yards rushing on like 15 attempts and stuff, you know? And like, and it would just be like six catches for 140 yards. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 or conversely six catches for 13 yards. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I mean, you know, in the past, he, I feel like those little short throws would kind of warm him up. And he still has them now. But, you know, when you have that kind of volume, I mean, I don't know. Just for example, quickly, let's just look at his um, so his attempts this year with with uh, two more two ga- two games to go. He's at 478. OK, mm-hmm. last yep. year. um he he threw the ball 673 times, and wow, he completed yeah. he completed 471. That's a career high for both 
for both uh, attempts and completions last year. Right. Uh, they were seven and nine, and they've been you know they've had losing seasons the last three seasons. So I can see why they're shifting. They're shifting to the the run attack, and it makes sense with their personnel. But uh, in terms of fantasy and uh, gaudy passing stats. Uh, no, it, it does leave me a little it, sad. It makes me a little it, sad. It's put a dent in that for sure. Yeah. So is this the fewest att- This will. He's on pace then with these last two games. I think they play at. No, they play Atlanta at home and then they play at Tampa. Mm. Is he on pace for the fewest attempts since he's been in New Orleans? I, I would think he is. I think he is. I mean, the yeah. fewest he had was the first year uh, for a whole season. Um, he had 554 his first year. And he mm-hmm. completed 64% with 356 completions. So, and then he shot up after that year um, to 440 completions and 652 attempts. And that was kind of in that range. Although now I'm looking, and uh, he only played 15 games in 09, and he only had 514 um, attempts, and they were 13 and 2. And so, so you know, it's a little. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if, but that one is probably skewed by the fact that that's because that's the year they won the Super Bowl, and he yeah. didn't play in that last game because they were sitting their starters. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So that one's a little, a it's little. A, skewed, it's a little but. skewed. So yeah, I think I think he's probably going to throw. Uh, you know, I, mean, I haven't seen the schedule. His schedule. Maybe they have like a good opponent coming up, so maybe he'll have to throw more. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. But he's certainly not the Drew Brees that uh, we've known in the past. Well, we we love you, Drew. Yes, he's still going to throw for over four thousand passing yards. You know, he's yeah. If that really means anything anymore in today's NFL pass happy league. Oh it, oh, it always it always means something to me. Yeah, yeah. This has been this has been the weekly New Orleans Saints segment. That's right on the Gotti Stats podcast. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, my friend. So we go into outliers now? Let's do it. All right. So I wanted to do a segment where I discussed a player's statistical output in a given season that was completely out of sync with the rest of his career. (laughs) <laughs> um, you mentioned Peyton Hillis yes uh, quick caveat before I get into this I didn't want to use someone I think this is a much more um, enjoyable and less depressing exercise when you don't throw injuries in right yeah. so for yeah. example um, I think about like Steve Slayton who had a really awesome year with the Texans in what would that have been like 08 or 09 and then he had an injury a a neck injury which basically affected the rest of his career and caused his career to end early that is not to me really totally fair because he had I think he had I want to say he had he either had like a he was from a hit or he had some kind of like degenerative condition I forgot all Um, about that that guy what's that I forgot all about him he had a hell of a season yeah he had a really good season, and he was like – the, the following year, there was like a legitimate – it's funny to look back at the sort of discussions in the offseason with fantasy like, oh, do you take Steve Slate? There was there was a year where it was like, do you take Steve Slayton or Chris Johnson, right? <laughs> now, that conversation aged poorly, but mm. in the moment before Steve Slayton's career ended early, it, it, it seemed – like a like a reasonable conversation. Yeah. Uh, but Ben, the the guy I want to zero in on, uh, and I think maybe the poster child for outliers, for the guy who had one great season inexplicably relative to all the other seasons he ever had, is a wide receiver. Um, I'm looking at his 2007 season. You'll notice, by the way, a recurring theme. I don't want to speak for you, but in mine, there's, we just, you know, I feel like we're going to get into a lot of stuff that go, that happens between like 2003 and 2009. Mm. I don't know why, but that's just sort of like, those are, I guess, are formative football years for me. Just like really 
paying attention to the league and, and playing fantasy football and, and all the rest. I just feel like yeah. um, there's a, there's a, I, there's like a sort of special sentimental place for that period of the, of the NFL for me. So yeah, I tend point. to focus on that, on that period um, when I look at this stuff. So, and this one is no exception, but then I'm looking at the 2007 stat line of a 24 year old wide receiver mm. out of the university of Michigan. He was the, does it say which he was the third overall pick? In the 2005 draft, mm. he had the classic third-year breakout, mm-hmm. which used to be a thing for receivers. I think that's completely been just totally destroyed in recent years with as good as some rookie receivers have been. You know, I, Odell Beckham, Mike Evans, mm-hmm. um, uh, other players come to mind. I'm speaking, of course, in this long-winded introduction of Mr. Braylon Edwards oh! of the Cleveland Browns. Now, I want to give you his 2007 season. He started all 16 games for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, he had 80 receptions for 1,289 yards and 16 touchdowns. The touchdowns are crazy. Let me – okay, Braylon played through 2012. He was out of the league by the time he was 30. Uh, he was a pro bowler at age 24. But here are the – now, they they occurred in different seasons. But here are the, the uh, season highs in receptions, yards, and touchdowns in, in other seasons, okay? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, career highs or whatever, right? He never had in any other season. He never had more than 61 catches, so he had 19 more catches than his next best season. He never had more than 904 yards, so this was his only 1,000-yard receiving season. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like so he had 385 more yards than his next best season. And then the most ridiculous one: he never had more than seven touchdowns in any other season, and most years he had either three or four. This season, Ben, he had 16. Ugh. Was that Derek Anderson? That is Derek Anderson. And the Cle- the 2007 Cleveland Browns, with Romeo Crennel at the helm, went 10-6. <laughs> they, they just missed the playoffs. It is the only year since 2002 that the Browns <laughs> have had a winning season. <laughs> I mean, wait, was that was two thousand was two thousand two Kelly Holcomb? I think it was. Yeah, I, I remember they that because that was like wild, our senior year of high school. Yeah, they played the wild card game at Pittsburgh and they yeah. lost by like three or four with Tommy I mean, Gun with Tommy like Gun a, Maddox. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, this this was pre Roethlisberger. It was Maddox. Uh, the Browns were like going with a platoon of Tim Couch and Kelly Holcomb, um, and they rode that thing all the way to the playoffs. Uh, anyway, but for for the 2007 Browns, you had Derek Anderson, who also it appears made the Pro Bowl at age 24. Um, 1300 yard rusher Jamal Lewis. Oh yeah, of as course. As a 28 year old. Um, so I guess this is after he had left the Ravens, obviously. Um, he got out of jail. I think it was after he was out of jail. Okay. Uh. You had a 24-year-old Pro Bowl tight end who had 82 catches for 1,106 yards and five touchdowns by the name of Kellen Winslow. Mm. Um, You had a wily veteran who had 50 catches and three touchdowns named Joe Juravicious. Of course. You had a 24-year-old promising special teams player who, it appears, scored... Uh, let's see, three special teams touchdowns by the names of by the name of Josh Cribbs. Oh, um, damn! They yeah. they were running the Wildcat with him and stuff. I remember he was like fantasy. I don't know if they were running the Wildcat this particular year, oh, okay, but they yeah. did at some point. Yeah, he was like a fantasy viable pre- guy there for a while. This might have been pre Wildcat. Hmm. Uh, Wildcat started by Ronnie Brown, which, by the way, at some point we need a segment on stupid plays. I found this play last night. I don't know if you remember it. It's from the vault, deep in the vault. But 2011, when Ronnie Brown was on the Eagles, 
there was a play where they were actually playing the Niners, and the game was in Philly, mm. and Ronnie Brown got the ball inside the five, the Niners' five-yard line on a carry, and he attempted to throw the ball as he was being tackled. Do you remember this play? <laughs> I mean, there's, like, shades of it. I can remember, like, it's, like, very blurry. I, I think I can, kind of, but I don't yeah. remember it definitively. It's like not like right. Well, clear. Go, go, go on YouTube after we're done recording. Listeners, please, everyone, go on and, and look at this. Ronnie Brown had a fumble in 2011. It's probably the dumbest, the single dumbest play. It's, pro- it, it's probably worse than the, the butt fumble. To, well, the butt fumble to me was just 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 a fluke, and, yeah. and Sanchez was just. It's just it's more about Sanchez just not being good. It's I mean, so Ronnie funny Fumble though. Was, it's so funny though. Oh, it's oh, it's funny. It makes me I laugh every time is. I see it. I can watch it like over and over again and just laugh constantly. I mean, I don't know something. Yeah, about... that's no, that's fair. The butt fumble is is, I mean, it's probably the worst play, <laughs> but this is the dumbest play <laughs> right. because Ronnie Brown had been in the league for like seven, five or seven, six or seven years, and he just, as he's being tackled short of the goal line, he just throws the ball over his head. Like he's playing on the Harlem Globetrotters. Okay, and, I'm wa- I'm watching it right now as you talk. Yeah. <laughs> and Andy Reid is just like he doesn't even know how to. Re- he's so he's stunned, and he doesn't know how to react because he can't believe what he just watched. Because it's like he throws it when his back is like to the goal line. Like he's it's not like he can even see or receive it. <laughs> Are you watching? Yes. Yeah. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Peyton, or not Peyton, but um, Eli. A few weeks ago, he was getting pulled down, and he just—it was something you do when you're playing in the backyard football. He just uh-huh. cranked back and just threw the ball into the ground, and there's just—I yeah. think they recovered. So the opposing team recovered and took it back for a touchdown. But yeah. uh, <laughs> and there was a play where Russell Wilson last week. I don't know if you saw, he was being tackled by like four Rams because the Seahawks got obliterated. And he like tried oh, to God. throw the ball as he was being spun around and he like threw the ball backwards. Oh, no. Did you see that? He no. He threw it like backwards out of bounds. Okay, I got to watch um, that. Yeah, it, it was also not great. But yeah, Ronnie Brown, founder of the Wildcat. Uh, latter years, not as kind to him. Anyway, sorry, that was a hard left turn to the Wildcat. And, oh, and no, Ronnie that's, Brown. that's what but, we do uh, on this podcast. It's all about the change. It's true. It, Fair, fair. But uh, the Browns, yeah, man, like Braylon Edwards. I mean, I had one of those things, too, where it's like, and and I, I think you can sympathize with this. It became sort of like a special attachment in terms of statistics and fantasy football with uh, with Braylon Edwards after this season um, because yeah. he, I was, he was on my team. And he, I mean, he had 16 touchdowns in 16 games. Uh, I remember one specific game against the Dolphins where he had three touchdowns. And, you know, I mean, he looked for all the world like he was going to be a DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones type receiver. Yeah, like a proto- prototypical guy. I mean, 6'3", six, yeah, six, six, 211. Totally. Totally. Right? And to the point that, like, you know, in the years after when, like, he couldn't catch and his his target his target to catch rate was terrible – um, balls would just hit him in the face. They'd go through his hands. You know, people would ridicule him. The the Browns eventually ran him out of town. He played for the Niners. Uh, so he played for the Niners. He played for the Jets. I was the guy who was like, you got, you got, you guys. Braylon, Braylon can, he, he can still play. He ha- I still he, believe in you, Braylon. He had that one year. The biggest fan. He had that one year. You guys will see. You'll yeah. Play. Yeah. Just well, it, but here's what happened. Here's as it turned out, uh, that never came back. It no. was just a, it was a, it was a one-hit wonder, right? He was the, he was the football equivalent of that of, thing you uh, do. That thing you do of of Rockwell, with somebody's watching me, <laughs> right? Or the Oneaters, yeah. Yeah. That's a catchy um, song, uh, Rockwell. That song. It's a, yeah. Barry Gordy's nephew. Like, you know yeah, that? nepotism for sure. 
Yeah. Um, and and I'm like, sure, like, I think Michael kids, Jackson, like, helped produce it. He or, sang the hook. Yeah, 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 he, yeah, and Michael Jackson sang the hook. I mean, you got um, Michael Jackson singing your hook. It's it's insane. Yeah. And, like, his... So who is, and, who and, is and, Michael and, Jackson? Is there a Michael Jackson is in this analogy? Braylon is Rockwell, and then... There isn't really a Michael Jackson. There's not. No, Michael, I mean Michael Jackson. <laughs> Michael Jackson is Romeo Cornell. Yeah, I mean Rockwell actually. Yeah, I don't know what the the, the analogy is for this one. I mean, maybe it's not the best analogy because, you know, because if you listen to the 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 lyric part, like the non-chorus parts of the song, yeah. they're awful. Like he's like Terrible. he's like oh no, 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 no. oh someone's watching me oh what am I, what am I gonna do it's like there's no melody there's no I'm afraid to watch my house yeah it's like if uh, you know Barry Gordy got got like a demo tape from yeah. from his son who wasn't actually his son like some random guy. It's like really weird. It's like B minus slam poetry. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm walking down the street. I'm having a great time. Yeah. And I get a hot dog yeah. and spill it on myself. Oh, yeah. you'd be like, this yeah. is trash, and you'd throw it away immediately. But it was a son. And then you get you get the biggest pop star on the planet to sing the to sing the chorus. Yeah, it's. Uh, I probably just blew out my little headset mic doing that. I, I don't part. know what the Browns. I don't know how this. I feel like there's some sort of Browns analogy here with with yeah. this entire uh metaphor but uh there's something there there's something yeah and you know, look we don't want to shit on the browns too much i mean i think no. you're going to talk maybe a little bit about peyton hellas but you know Owen 14 this year they were one in 15 last year mm-hmm. you know and i'm not i'm really not trying to be an asshole here but uh do you ever think like sometimes i just occasionally will think i remember thinking this like uh a, a year or two ago with the Browns um, and with a couple other teams, but but most specifically the Browns, mm. like technically they are eligible for the Super Bowl. You ever think about that? Like, oh. like in yeah. February, it's like you know the Browns play in the same league. <laughs> I mean they're technically in the NFL. It's not fair. Uh, I mean you know when I think of the Browns, I think it's because of their name. You know, I know it's supposed to be like they're dogs, but I just think it's shit. You know, when I think of the Browns, species. yeah, I think of like a doo doo pie because like they're called they're called the yeah. Browns, you know, and and it, there's just something. Obviously, it's been talked about ad nauseum. There is a cloud hanging over that team, but I tell you, I like Hugh Jackson. I hope they 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 are gonna he's gonna be there next year. Actually, I was gonna say I hope they sign him, they keep him on, but. I think he's a decent coach, and I think he's good for like a young team like that. I don't know what to think of Kaiser, because um, it's just been. Are you the, concerned at all about the fact that Hugh Jackson is one in twenty nine as a head coach? <laughs> okay, all right, that's a gaudy stat. Uh, I did not know that. I knew he was awful. He was with the Raiders, right? He was. Sorry, and and that this doesn't count. Obviously, he actually was was pretty good as, as the Raiders coach, but and the Browns did not Browns, won this year. They have not won, no. Oh, that's and of course, there's, sad. The stat, there's the stat that's been bandied about because they won on Christmas Eve last year, which was a Saturday. Mm. So Hugh Jackson has not won a game on a Sunday as the Browns coach, oh and I believe they God. haven't won. They haven't won a game on a Sunday since like November or October of 2015. So really, they're okay. So they play the Bears, and then they play the Steelers. So the Steelers might sit people. I'm guessing. They, conceivably, they could, yeah. The Bears are going to be fighting, probably. I mean, it, it would depend, though, because the Steelers are now they're tied with the Patriots, and as long as they keep winning, if the Patriots somehow sli- slipped up, which I, they're not going to lose to the Bills or the Jets at home, but let's say they never know. there was a chance, you never know, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the Steelers have to play out that string and – yeah, I think the the Brownies' chance to win and get a win is going to be this week at Soldier Field, and if they don't do that, then that is all she wrote. Yeah, it could be a crazy game with weather, and you never know what could happen in that kind of environment. But um, God, man. Browns, Browns, Bears. If you attend that game in person, <laughs> I just, I think you, I think, uh, I think there needs to be some sort of. Um, can we put the people? Maybe put the people. 
exiting the stadium in some kind of concussion protocol. Or like they have to get checked by a doctor. Like, why did you come here? You know, Christmas uh, Eve. You got you got probably good food, stocking stuff. You got family. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah. Uh, we're in a cold place. You decided to come watch uh, Mitch Trubisky versus Deshaun Kaiser. You made the choice. Yeah. You you decide. I mean. We, we, you don't have to. You don't have to put children in because presumably they didn't make their own choice to, mm. to go to the game. But anyone over the age of eighteen, I think, needs to to, to have their head checked. But we will yeah. get back to the two thousand seven Browns. Well, I also right. really fast, I want to point out it's going to be twenty nine and it's going to twenty nine degrees out and it's going to snow on Sunday. So they'd have to be oh, even oh, crazier. Oh yes. Just inject inject that game straight into my vein. Yeah. It's yeah. It's going to be like twelve twelve to ten. That's or, that's or like a that's a little six. high. That's a little high. <laughs> eight to eight to six. I, I'm thinking I'm thinking like six to three, or like three okay. three to zero. Remember there was that game a long time ago. It was like the I think the Steelers were playing, maybe Steelers Ravens, and it was like crazy weather with rain or maybe snow, and it was three yeah. three to zero. You remember that? Yes, yes. Disgusting. There's been a couple of those. There was a three to nothing. You're talking about the Monday night, the Steelers Monday night game. I, I can't remember. A, I can't remember. The Steelers exactly. played a Monday night game against the Dolphins, and the final was three to nothing. Maybe that was it. That might have been it. Uh, it was, I think, uh, one of the worst, probably the worst Monday night game in history. Uh, I want to say oh seven on that. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, yeah, but no. Line. This is look. The last 15 years, this 2007 Brown season is really the only thing that they've had to look upon in a positive light. And it gave them sort of false hope because they did have all these good young players mm. and it just, it never happened for any of them. Now crumbled. Nobody had, but perhaps no one is as emblematic of the outlier on this team as Braylon Edwards. I mean, Derek Anderson, I guess you could argue too, but mm. um, Braylon just, he had this one good year and then it just, it never happened again for him. Um, yeah, he had a decent year with the Jets, 900 yards, seven touchdowns, but it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't close to what he had had before. It wasn't, no, right. You know, he 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 had there was a there was like a reclamation project there. They're like, okay, let's bring in Braylon. He was the number one. You know, he put up those stats before. You know, he could be the number one type receiver. I think they might have had somebody else, like Lavernius Coles or something. Mm-hmm. And um, but yeah, he just didn't. He never got back to that. Uh, those those gaudy numbers, sadly. Yeah. So Sorry, sad. Braylon. So sad. Well, uh, I'll 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 hit up uh, Peyton Hills really fast. <clears throat> um, I don't Wait. know as much about the backstory of Peyton. I don't remember. Um, he played for Denver two seasons prior uh, to his breakout. Uh, so it was 2008, 2009. He's with Denver. He was like a a fullback slash running back. His uh, first year, he's kind of a Rod Smith type, perhaps. Um, we haven't come up with a name for those kind of backs. I guess El- he was kind of like an elephant beetle back. Um, didn't put up any stats at all. Then um, now, Sam, did somebody get hurt in that 2010 season when he arrived into Cleveland? Did he or did he, did he just like did they just give him the reins? Because I feel like maybe somebody got hurt that was supposed to be the starter, and um, yeah, it was a slow burn. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would actually be a good nickname for Peyton Hillis, the slow burn. Because um, <laughs> I'm looking at his game I don't, log. I don't know. Let's uh-huh. look at let's look at his game log and see maybe. Yeah, give it to me. Because okay, I think somebody might have gotten hurt because his first two games. He only had nine attempts and eight attempts. Now, with uh-huh. the, with those numbers, he had a great uh, yards per carry. I mean, he was – actually, no, he didn't. What am I saying? That was uh, his receiving <laughs> – his receiving yeah. yards per reception. He's getting a lot of receptions. I mean, so, in he, between week two and week three, who was the Browns coach that year? Oh, God. Does it matter? I don't Did the Browns know. ever have a coach? <laughs> Are the Browns a real franchise? Have they been a, a figment of our imagination for many years now? We know. I, man, I don't know. But all I know is week three. So let's okay. So let's, let me just set the stage a little bit in terms of stats. 
He had 40, okay. 41 rushing yards his first week, 35 his next week. You know, so he's he was rushing uh, 4.5, 4.6 roughly his first week per carry, then 4.38. Then he burst onto the scene against Baltimore, 22 rushes for 144 yards and a touchdown. And oh, seven, yes. seven receptions for 36 yards. Then Patty, our friend Patty, picks him up off the waiver wire, and the rest is history. No, um, oh, yeah. But this, this, is, that, this is his 2010 season? Yeah. And uh, I thought that Che had him that year. Maybe. I thought, the slop, I thought, I thought I think Patty the had him. Slop don- the slop donkeys rode him to a title. <laughs> maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe Che did have him. He might have had him. Um. Yeah. That's our friend in So, so uh, like Australia. sometime in the first third of the season, the Browns offensive staff was having a meeting. They were discussing how to get their best players the ball, how to put their team in the best position to succeed. And somebody in that meeting was like, you know, uh, I actually think Peyton Hillis is, is kind of like Gail Sayers. <laughs> and I think we need to – Earl Campbell more I think like we, I think, yeah, Earl Campbell. But it is, it is funny how – when you really immerse yourself in a, in a given NFL season or a couple of NFL seasons, how quickly your opinion can change or how, even if it doesn't, even if you didn't have an opinion initially, how quickly it can solidify Mm. because like Peyton Hill is completely forgettable seasons with the Broncos. Right. And then suddenly it's like, okay, he's had a couple games. Uh, good games for the Browns, but then he like keeps having good games, and yeah. before you know it, he like has a good season, and then he's on the cover of Madden. That was right? that was crazy. The man was on the cover of Madden. All right, he was on the cover of Madden, and what would that have been? That would have been the 2011 Madden 2011 or mm. Madden 2012. Yeah, Something like that. but it, it's just funny because you go from the curse. You, sort of go, you, you go from the progression of like Peyton Hillis, he's not good to. Is Peyton Hillis good? To Peyton Hillis is good. And now you sound ne- like Bill Simmons. The next thing you know, then the next thing you know, uh, you are like earnestly with a straight face, being like Peyton Hillis. Is, you know he's good. Yeah. Well, he was one like, of those things where. Well, it was probably one of those things where, like, you know, he has a huge game, and then all the fantasy pundits, the Brad Evans types, are like. Oh, that was just a flash in the pan. Actually, he he usually is like he likes the uh, you know the sleeper, so maybe he liked them. But like you know what I'm saying, like a lot of people were probably yeah. like, oh no, don't pick him up. You know, he's it's just a flash in the pan. But Samuel, his, That's, that was kind of that was also me. Yeah, I, I was I, I, I didn't pick him up. I didn't. I was like, I'm not picking that guy up. <clears throat> yeah. But the amount of carries he got was I should have I should have known because the next uh-huh. week he had 27. Then. He had 27 carries for 100 yards and a touchdown. Uh, the next three weeks, he you know, he he has some decent receiving numbers. Like the next week he had four for 49 and a touchdown through the air, but he was only 10 for 28 on the ground. Then he was 12 for 41 on the ground. Then he was 16 for 69 with a touchdown. But then, Samuel, <laughs> but then uh-huh. at home against the vaunted – New England, New England Patriots. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say he torched the Packers. No, What did no. he do against the Patriots? Sam, I want you to guess how many uh, rush attempts he had. <laughs> guess how many rush attempts he had. Are we are we entering uh, Larry Johnson flagrant misuse territory here? Yes. I'm going to guess uh, 32 rushes. Oh, oh, God, you went over it. Went over it by three. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, no, no. I, I should, 29. I should, no, I shouldn't. No, you got it exactly right. 29. Yeah. 29, all right? How many rushing yards? Don't cheat. Don't cheat, Sam. Uh, no, no, I'm not. Uh, 150. 184. Holy shit. And he had two touchdowns. Damn. And he had three catches for 36 yards. The man went over 200 <laughs> scrimmage yards oh, in that game. Against, yeah, and, you're, and you're they won the game. The, they won the game 34 to 14. Yeah, in your face, Patriots. Um. Bill Belichick's old team getting revenge on him. Uh, yeah, you're talking about the Bill Simmons thing where it's like, are we sure he's good? Yeah. I don't know if Peyton Hillis is good. Yeah, are we sure thing. he's good? I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of, I don't know. That's kind of, um, I, I wouldn't say I was saying, are we sure he's good? I was just kind of like, I mean, 
let's just wait this no, out. No, you, you, by the end of the, the you end weren't of the doing year, the Bill Simmons saying, thing. You were not doing the. I, I was just, I was just playing around. You were not doing the Bill Simmons thing. Well, I just took it as a, as oh, yeah, an opportunity good. to do me being cousin Sal being Bill Simmons. Yeah. Are you sure he's cousin, cousin Sal? Cousin Sal. You sure he's I cousin? love Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> does does my, he like Jimmy Garoppolo? Does he like him? I bet he likes him. Oh, he loves it. He goes sure. crazy for him. But yeah. so, uh, uh, no, but look, um, Peyton Hillis, you know, running style, I would say if I were a scout and I were putting some phrases into the to the report on him, you know, sort of like a, a loose, like a loose, <laughs> like a feral <laughs> bighorn sheep running <laughs> <laughs> or a ram with like those big the yeah the big horns yeah exactly yeah like the ram like, like ram with huge huge horns just uh, bashing into the uh, defenders yeah he had that he had that like that shoulder pad thing in the back that was like a little higher than the rest of his shoulder pads the full and he, back shoulder he pads. would he would just get loose and you felt like the Browns trainers, there needed to be like a tranquilizer. Someone needs to come out with like a tranquilizer gun and shoot him. He'd just be running like a like a loose horse. <laughs> oh God. Well, okay, so that so that Patriots game was like the crown jewel, as I said, of his okay. statistical which, which output. Week is but uh that was week, week eight. That was week eight. Now week eight of the twenty ten season? Yes. Now week okay. uh, week eleven Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, this could have been around Thanksgiving time, maybe. No, it wasn't. It was probably the week after Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah. That was um, Thanks- Thanksgiving is usually week twelve, I think. Oh, isn't it? Well, it this is. year week twelve was December. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, December fifth. So okay, then yeah, you, never mind. You're right. You're right. Well, yeah. I, I, okay, so this is this is November twenty eighth that I'm talking about right now. Right. So Cleveland against Carolina. Okay, mm-hmm. so I mentioned the other game where he's 29 for 184, two touchdowns and 36, you know, uh, receiving yards. So yep. he's playing Carolina. Samuel Carolina is awful that year because Cam Cam Newton is still playing for Auburn. They were bad, yeah. uh, and in a barn burner, the, the Browns won 24 to 23. Peyton mm-hmm. Peyton uh, slapped on 26 rushing attempts for 131 yards. Three touchdowns. He was targeted eight times in the passing game for six receptions and 63 <laughs> yards. The man had wow. over 190 scrimmage yards, beasting his way into uh, Gaudy Stats lore. Peyton Hillis. Have you ever heard the rumor Peyton that Hillis. when he, would, when he wow. would get in the open field, he would start making sounds like a like a burrow? Or a donkey? <laughs> I think a donkey is a good is it, is it ram or donkey. Yeah, he. Ah, uh, how's a donkey? I, I can't even do a donkey like, noise. Uh. Ew, ew. <laughs> like, how are you supposed to? If he gets to the second level of defenders and you're trying to tackle him, and he's making he's making donkey noises. I know. I mean that that probably gets him an extra two or three yards. His yeah. yak is improved by his by his sound effect. <laughs> I mean, the thing with him was that I found so interesting, and it was kind of like you're talking about, like, I guess he's good now kind of thing, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. The man had breakaway speed in some of these games. Like, he would be – he would get to the second level on the sideline, and you would, like, adjust your glasses. Like, is that – is that a – that that looks like, you know – I'm trying to think of another running back who looks like him who's fast. Maybe, like, Eric Dickerson – I mean, the, the uh-huh. man, like a big guy who, who I mean, he would get on the sideline and burn. He would burn uh, the secondary down the sideline for for long TDs. It wasn't just like, you know, elephant ramming his way through the foliage, you know, crashing right. into guys. Back then, you know, because like, like, check this out, okay? So against Jacksonville um, on week, in week 10 of that year, that was probably the Thanksgiving game. Uh, mm-hmm. he had okay. So he he was he was donking it up. Uh, twenty one for forty eight on the ground. Not good. <laughs> oh lord. Not good at all. But yeah. then in the passing game, six receptions uh-huh. for ninety five yards and a touchdown. Yeah. So um, that we I always like to see the running backs get those kind of receiving numbers. Let um, let the bighorn sheep eat. 
Exactly. It feed feed him. I mean, he should have been the guy who started doing the feeding thing because he really needed that. He really needed to be fed. I mean, he was just like, yeah. get the bu- say, roll the buffet if out. Done, if he had done the if he done the Zeke feed me thing, he would have actual. He'd have like he'd have like porridge with some uh, <laughs> like with some uh, he'd he would uh, some donkey oats snap off. I was gonna say he'd snap off some Slim Jim. He'd turn like a Slim Jim into little pellets and then spit them into some porridge. And then eat it after he scored. Um, oh, that'd be a great celebration. By the way, let me, I have the I have the 2011 draft our 2011 draft before us. Okay, mm. before mm. me, excuse me. Uh, can you guess which pick? Can you guess where this was when we were still doing uh, a a snake draft? Um, not we had not moved to auction yet. Can you guess where Peyton Hillis was drafted? Way too high after his his season. I, I bet okay. it was. I bet it was in the first round. I bet it was. I'd say eight, eight pick. So he wasn't in the first round. Oh. But he was in the second round. Jesus Christ! Now, do you have his 2011 season? Because I mean, there was a time, like even he 2011, where if you were who, it looks like, uh, it looks like, poor guy, our, our our good friend Patty drafted Peyton Hillis in that year, and like if you were playing Patty's team. Started off good. At least in, in in the first half of that year, you were probably looking at a matchup and being like, "Well, shit, he's got Peyton Hillis. Oh, Peyton Hillis shit. could uh, Peyton he could Hillis. go off." I mean, okay, so that year, I don't I don't like my matchups. I I have uh, <laughs> he's got Peyton Hillis. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. I mean, he he got hurt at some point, so it looks like I'm mean, going through his stats here. So he got hurt uh, in October, mid October, against. The Raiders. Before that, I mean, let's see. So he was getting a lot of touches. He was 17 for 57, which is very elephant-like. Um, <laughs> six, six for 30 through the air. So you still get. I mean, in our league, that would have been a hell of a game. I mean, all those attempts on the ground and then, and then the receptions. So it would have been a decent, you know, solid game. Then the next week against Indy, they win that game, 27 for 94. <laughs> so he's still in the elephant zone. Then uh, four for twenty three, but he had two rushing touchdowns that game. So uh, at that are you, point, are you on Pro Football Reference? Yes. Look at it. Have you looked at his headshot? Yeah, he looks like uh, his head. His head. He's, he's like an like extra in Mad Max or something. <laughs> his head is shaped like a car battery. Yeah, I mean he led with his head. One, he led with his he head. Looks, his head is it's like a Lego man. It's like a Lego person, but but real. Yeah, I mean. I'm sorry, Peyton Hillis. We don't mean to pick on you. You were a good player. Oh, he's a he hell of a player. Seventh, he was a seventh round pick. Like I would be, I would guy? be starstruck if I met Peyton Hillis. You know, and the yeah. point, and you, okay. So I'm looking at his game log. And you know, it's funny. I don't. I don't think I could quite go that far. <laughs> starstruck. But okay, so he was. I, I mean, would shake his hand. Yeah. He would. Pro- he would probably break my arm when yeah, I. Yeah, he probably. My hand. <laughs> that that second year he averaged. 3.65 yards a carry. So he he uh and then let's see what he got the his big year. Um I'm just curious because you know, let's see. So he was they the Man, fir- he really was an outlier. I'm looking at these stats now. The, the you are fir- not kidding. The first year he was with Cleveland we had that he huge had- year. 4.4 yards a carry. <laughs> The most so the decent. most receptions in any in any, any other year that he ever had was twenty two. Yeah. Did you already say that? I'm sorry if you no, already said that. No, no, I didn't. I, I didn't say that. Jesus. Sixty one. So, so he had Braylon, six, Well, let's let's ahead. just quickly just go through his all his like stats for that year, though, like as a whole. So he had yeah. two hundred and seventy rushes for one thousand one hundred and seventy seven yards, eleven touchdowns with a long of forty eight. So he had a little mm-hmm. bit of breakaway speed. He didn't have like a 90-yard run or anything, but he had breakaway speed. He averaged 73 yeah. rushing yards a game. And, yeah, I mean, he had 77 targets for 61 receptions. That's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a good uh, catch rate for yep. 477 and two touchdowns through the air. So he had 13 total touchdowns and uh, 1,654 yards from scrimmage. So – you know, it's not like an all-time rushing – it's not like an all-time also, running back line, but it's I, damn I scroll, good. I scrolled 
No, I agree. It is. 13 total touchdowns. I scrolled down to his passing stats. He he attempted two passes that year. He completed one of them for 13 yards. If you go down to his passing, he threw one pass. He threw two passes that year as a Brown, and then two years later as a Chief, he was 0 for 1. Well, he's like a regular I, I love, Muhammad Sanu. I would love to see what that 13 year 13 yard completion looked like as a Brown. <laughs> also, if you scroll up from there. His kick and punt returns. Denver had him returning kickoffs. Can you imagine that man running full speed at you, and you have to tackle him? Just, I mean, just the the bighorn sheep in the in the open, and you gotta like grab him by the horns. He's a beast. Down. I mean, he's a hell of an athlete. Like he's unlike um, <laughs> unlike Rod Smith of of today's of today's game. Um, the man the man was a huge man churning those uh those thighs and uh mm-hmm. breaking off big runs and just smashing into people i mean i think if you were um you know a, a, a svelte short cornerback you know um and you saw peyton hillis round the corner coming up the sideline what the hell are you going to do i mean you, you you would make a you would make a business decision and yeah. say nothing you'd probably go low now, which was the season in here it doesn't have it designated. Which was the season in here that he – in fact, I can't even say this with a straight face with, without breaking. I'm sorry. I was going to ask what the season was where he played uh, without a helmet. <laughs> 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 He's just like, I'm not going to wear a helmet. I've, I've uh, <laughs> developed a callus on top of my head that is stronger than a helmet. I don't need – no I longer mean, need his, a helmet. His, his head is already kind of a helmet. With yeah. his head, he's got a helmet. It's nature's helmet. Old helmet head, Hillis. What a what a player. Twenty. Let's go with twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen for the Giants. He played the whole season without a helmet. He had two <laughs> touchdowns. He had two touchdowns. He had thirteen receptions for ninety six yards, which is still better than Rudy Johnson's output. Mm. Shout out to Rudy Johnson. Yeah. Uh, the last year. 2014, he was still only 28. Not as great. Not as great. Mm -hmm. Uh, No touchdowns. Peyton Hillis, here's to you. Here's to you, Peyton. So so if if Braylon is Rockwell, if Braylon is Rockwell, who is Peyton Hillis? I think Peyton Hillis is is like, we got to think of a band that came out with like a hell of an album and then just kind of, you know, there was too many drugs, there was too much too many distractions and it just kind of disintegrated and mm-hmm. and none of the uh the members of the band really did anything afterwards kind of like a classic one hit wonder album maybe that like remember that song uh i believe in a thing called love what was Ooh, that? yeah what, what was that band i can't remember what they were called but the darkness they had a the, i liked that song thought it was really cool and they had you know that album i had never got it but i heard it was a good album so maybe we uh-huh. can we can uh we can we can yeah, the dark the darkness together. released their album that that album is from was it the same year as Peyton Hillis? It was not July seventh two thousand seven two thousand three. Oh God! What if what if they released their album the same week as he torched the Patriots? Then that would we would really know. Yeah, yeah, and see, like you know, just just like just like uh, so Peyton actually, Hillis I was going to say darkness. like. I was gonna say like Braylon, you can't because like Rockwell had no talent, you know. But Bray, Braylon had some talent, and Peyton Hills had some talent. So I guess, yeah. That's it. But like you know, Rockwell still that song was amazing. So and he was involved. So you got to give it to him. You got to give it to Rockwell. Sure. I guess you know, even though he Maybe. he sang like that. I mean, he was like the rock lobster kind of like he had he was doing <laughs> he was doing the B B fifty twos kind of like song but for you know a pop song or for like a do you, th- do you think Braylon knows who Rockwell is <laughs> you got to man it's a classic it's a classic do you track think Braylon, do you think he knows who hey, do you think he's heard of the Rock Lobster song <laughs> I actually don't think he's heard the Rock Lobster song if I had to guess well I, I just wish I could play us out with Rockwell but I can't because I don't have the rights to the music and yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to get this thing on Spotify, and and they you have to have, you have to be able, like I'm using, uh, 
non-royalty music or whatever. But sure. I, I would definitely play us out on Rockwell. Rock Lobster, by the way, B fifty twos. The 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 band was eluding me. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's so. a love shack, baby. <laughs> I always feel like some. No, it's, no that, that was actually the the good part of the song. Was what the about chords. that voice? That voice, except you're just reading stats. <laughs> Peyton Hill's <laughs> stats read or, or or read by the guy doing the um the uh the falsetto. In the darkness. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, do, do that would be the voice you're reading the stats. <laughs> you're reading his reception totals. Oh God! I'll bet, well, I'll bet Peyton Hillis has listened to the darkness. I will bet he knows that song. Yeah, I, 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 he's from I, Arkansas. I mean, he listened like that dude. Nineteen, born in 1986 from Arkansas. A lot of Lincoln Park. A lot of Evanescence. A lot of like really bad rap rock was in his oh, car God. in high school, I would guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure, and maybe some Slayer, a little bit of Metallica. You never know. Oh yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, I'm actually sure. watching Rockwell. Somebody's watching me. This is such a weird video. Have you seen yeah, the video? It's very weird. Yeah. It's like it's shot with like a VHS camera, and he's like walking through this house. He like pets a dog, and then he's in mm-hmm. the shower. When I come home at night. <laughs> I'm playing it right now. <laughs> That's why I always feel. I, I, I really okay. I'm gonna get the lyrics open really fast. Just I just want to like, cause like the lyrics are so weird. I'm just an average man with an average life. I work from nine to five. Hey hell, I pay the price. All I want is to be left alone in my average home. But why do I always feel like I'm in the twilight zone? It's like that, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing like uh, spoken word, and yeah. the, the beat is so good, and the chorus yeah. is so good that you just you kind of just stomach it. But like the actual lyrical part of it is so bad. But it's, it's funny. Not great. It's funny. I never it never bothered me, but. If you really, if you're, if you're waiting for the lyrics and so and somebody's watching me by Rockwell uh-huh. and not the chorus, uh-huh. then I never, I don't want to be your friend. And uh, something's seriously wrong with you. You need to get help. <laughs> if if you're if you're like a uh, hardcore uh, Rockwell lyrics guy, then I don't, I just don't want to be associated with you, whoever you are out there. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what. That's all fair. Yeah, but maybe maybe the person maybe the person who likes that earnestly all they want is to be left alone. Well, maybe they feel like someone's watching them. You never know. It's true. You never know, man. Yeah. Well, we've been we've been going for a while, Samuel. We're at the uh, hour thirty five mark. So I mean, um, that's that's the, yeah. This is uh, this has been we've touched on a number of subjects. Number of subjects. I think I think the intro was like fifty minutes long. So yeah. Um, which I enjoy. No, I, I, this is the, that's the kind of thing I want with this podcast. So Tim, Tim Rattay, Jimmy G, <laughs> Saints, uh, Peyton Hillis, Brown, extended Browns talk, extended Browns talk, <laughs> extended Rockwell, extended Rockwell, extended Rockwell talk, multiple Rockwell, can Rock, Rockwell can can spoken word the intro to Gaudy Steps. <laughs> I maybe I'll I'll reach out and see if I can get him on for an interview. And we can just talk about all the all the albums he sold off that one <laughs> smoking hot track off, off of off of Michael Jackson's voice. What do you think the other songs on his album are like? Oh God, I got to I'm, uh, I'm gonna go on a deep dive. Does, maybe he did some covers. You think what if every, he has a spoken? What if he has a spoken word cover of Human Nature? <laughs> or what if like every every the music on every song is like just a variation of the beat on somebody's watching me. It's just like they switched around a few of the chords. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, when um, MC Hammer had a huge hit with Can't Touch This, then like I think the next uh, album that came out, he had a song that was like very similar to Can't Touch, Can't Touch This. It yeah. was, it was yeah. actually, yeah. you know, almost the same song. It was like, right. maybe, maybe you can't touch this or something like that. You know, right. He kind of wanted to go back to that well. But yeah, so I'm going to do... So yeah, that's my homework for tonight. I'm gonna go online. 
look up some more Rockwell uh, songs, maybe purchase all his albums, get uh-huh. deep, get deep Rock, into Rockwell it. singing Rockwell singing bad, maybe broken <laughs> bad. Your butt is mine. <laughs> Uh, he, he kind of invented a new form of music in a way. He kind of like started yeah. a new type of music. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. The outlier, the outlier for the next week can be Lou Bega. How about that? Oh God, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, or like the Macarena type thing. But that the Macarena Ooh, yeah. was like, you know, that was that was an international super hit. I mean, those guys are basically. So we need a so we need to find an cash. outlier from the NFL with international. Oh no no, that would be we need an NBA player. Mm. Do we have a one-year NBA player who could be the Macarena? Maybe like well, Anthony Randolph, but he never really had a huge year. Ooh, That's a tough yeah, one. It, had, it has to be somebody who got hurt. It has to be somebody who had like an amazing year. But even like you know, I don't, Grant... don't want to hurt your feelings and say and suggest Andre Kirilenko because then he had like one awesome year, but then the rest of the time uh, that does hurt my okay. feelings, Sam. Because uh, <laughs> I'm gonna do a Andre Kirilenko podcast. No, he was he was he was very good before he. I thought before he got hurt though, right? You're probably right. Kinda... Well, he had a he had an amazing defensive stats. I mean, he, he yeah. the man had a five five and five and five. Oh, I I listened I listened about the five five and five. He was uh, he stuffed the he stuffed the stat sheet. The stat yeah, sheet. I mean, I think I think nowadays, I mean, if his career had shifted forward like you know eight years, you know, he would be like. A great seventh man off the bench for the Warriors. Oh yeah, yeah, and, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like a just stre- a stretch five who can, who can like force only, the center to come out and. Yeah. Only problem with him though is he couldn't shoot. That was one of his problems. Oh, could he not? Sh- for some reason, I thought he could shoot. Okay. Maybe you're right. But he's not really a he's not really a stretch five. Well, like you, well, you know his game better than I would. I maybe he can. You would think I would, but I don't, I haven't really examined his. I mean, this man was like, he's like a, a legend, um, a Russian basketball legend. Oh, I had legend. a friend in college who was obsessed with him and just like, uh, just, like, you know, could not get past the fact that he looked like one of the one of the characters when you were doing, playing like GoldenEye multiplayer. Yes. And like, you could just easily, if you were scrolling, you could, you could happen upon Andre Kirilenko. He looks like a villain. He truly does. But yeah. Yeah. so like, let's see, he's a career, see, he's a career, um, Thirty-one percent three-point shooter. Not great. But he did have one year. Oh seven. Oh seven. Kobe. Oh, yeah, really. Um, he was okay in oh seven oh eight. He was shooting about thirty-eight percent. So he had a, he had a good year. Um, one one year where he mm-hmm. was he was stroking it a little bit. Um, and the man averaged three point three blocks a game. Oh four oh five. It's kind of like his uh. I would say his claim to fame, you know, but right. he, he he was just, I mean, he got a lot of steals, got a lot of blocks. I mean, the year before that, he had an interesting line, 16.5 points, eight rebounds, three assists, two steals, almost three blocks. That's kind of like, that's kind of what you would get, but he would, he would like disappear for a couple games, but then he'd come out with like, you know, 10 points, seven blocks. You know, like two steals, six assists, seven rebounds. You know what I'm saying? Like, he he would, right. he, he could just throw up some crazy defensive numbers and bunches. But he would affect the game in a lot of ways too. Indeed, he would. Um, okay, let, let's let's end this before we go on for another another hour yeah. hour and thirty I minutes. I, I would love to come on for the Dirk Nowitzki uh, retrospective that you no, actually yeah. have. We're gonna do, we'll we'll do a Dirk one together. Uh, for sure, yes, we'll do a breeze yeah, one. Man. We'll do a breeze one together. Uh, there's many, there's many more we'll do together. Uh, there's, there's so many. I was thinking about it. There's, there's, you know, like guys like. Um, there's just so many pods to be devoted to certain players. Like not even necessarily stars, but also like you know, of course the Hall of Famers. But for instance, I want to do a pod all about Dennis Rodman. Uh-huh. You know, I want to do a pod all about Tiny Archibald. There's a lot of guys kind of forgotten players, you know. Like, I think Tiny was the only one to ever average 30 points in 10 assists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, but like, he wasn't the only one, but he was, like, one of a few. I think Russ uh, – obviously, Westbrook did it um, when he got a triple-double, and I think Harden might have done it as well. But um, it had been a while before the, those guys accomplished that feat. And um, anyways, all right. Don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. Samuel, 
It's a pleasure. It was a Always pleasure. Always a pleasure, Simmons. Scotty Stats is taking off. The people are getting excited. We're building, We're building. A, brace, a base. I, yes. I didn't notice where they did say brand or base, so I said brace. We're not really building it. You're building it. This I'm building all about you a, and, and your brace. product. No, you you are part of the team, Sam. You are. Listen, we're gonna have you on. The cult, you're changing the culture. You're changing the podcast culture. <laughs> yeah, you see, Sam. I don't know if you knew this, but I'm the only I'm the only podcaster, <laughs> only podcaster to invite his friends on his podcast and I mean, I, yeah. create like a free flowing, uh, you know, atmosphere that occasionally touches on mature subjects. That's I, right. But see, now you bring on these guys. And occasionally, or oftentimes, you raise everyone's level. Like, you know, I mean, let's be like the Kemp podcast. You know, you gotta you gotta lift him up a little bit, right? I mean, he's kind of he's kind of treading water. Kemp you know, came in uh, hot, though. I, I gotta say, slobbering, slobbering about. No, Kemp was actually remarkably reasonable. Re- reasonable on that. Did, on you, that did, um, did you listen to the part where he was going? Like, he was listing all of Brady's accomplishments. It was just yeah. a deluge. I like how he, he got he got that in at the end and he was just he, he Yeah, I thought it was over he was and like, he's like, Hold on a second. Were playing, <laughs> you were playing him off with the with the Oscar Oscar music and he was just reading Brady's <laughs> Super Bowl stats. Um which was fun. Also him, you know, having the the, the uh what I assume was not a scripted moment where his child was asking if he would if uh Chris would bathe him. Um, <laughs> no, that was all, all that was unscripted. It was all unscripted. You have, to, you have to leave it all in, though. You have to sh- the warts and all. You have to yes. have it be raw, uncut. Exactly. Right. Except when I make yeah. a mistake, then I cut it out. Like and when I, I yeah. Then I, but but for, but for anybody, for the guests, any mistake they make, uh, mm-hmm. I leave that in. But all the mistakes that I make, I cut them out. Like I right. couldn't find a certain stat when I was talking to him. Cut that out. He was like, "You better leave this in." I was like, "No, nope, cut any cutting of our, our Rockwell content." Oh no, I'm yeah, not. He was like, "I'm not cutting any like, of this hey, one out." Hey, cut it! Uh, you cut this, and you, then you were away. He was away, and you were saying, "I'm not going to cut any of this. This is yeah. all staying in." Yeah. Oh, hey, Chris, how's yeah. it going? It's just you tell know. Me more, tell me more about Julian Edelman. Like basically, Chris and yeah. I's conversations are just trolling each other, basically back and forth. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you know. That's what friends are for, and uh, yeah, this this is going to be raw, uncut, uh, hour and forty four minutes plus of uh, Rockwell talk. Can't you know? It's just going to be um, it's going to be the number one podcast I think for Gaudy Stats thus far. And uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Simmons. NFL, fix your damn catch rules. They're stupid. I know. We'll talk to you next time. Jesse James, come on. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.